Okay, I'd like to call the October 2nd, 2015 meeting of the Board of Education to order. First item, uh, invocation, Ms. Etheridge. Hello, I hope everyone's doing well. Read a little story. I know y'all think I'm hung up on the beach, but I guess that's my place that I go and reflect on on life in general, and um, so I just wanted to read you this short story. The beach is not the place to work, to read, write, or think. I should have remembered that from other years. Too warm, too damp, too soft for any real mental discipline or sharp flights of spirit. One never learns. Hopefully, one carries down the faded straw bag, lumpy with books, clean paper, long overdue unanswered letters, freshly sharpened pencils, list, and good intentions. The books remain unread, the pencils break their points, and the pads rest smooth and unblemished as the cloudless sky. No reading, no writing, no thoughts even, at least not at first. At first the tired body takes over completely, as on shipboard one descends into a deck chair apathy. One is forced against one's mind, against all tidy resolutions, back into the primeval rhythms of the seashore. Rollers on the beach, wind in the pines, the slow flapping of herons across sand dunes, drown out the hectic rhythms of a city and suburb, timetables and schedules. One falls under their spell, relaxes, stretches out prone. One becomes, in fact, like the element on which one lies, flattened by the sea, bare, open, empty as the beach, erased by today's tides of all yesterday's scribblings. And then some morning in the second week, the mind wakes, comes to life again, not in a city sense, no, but beach-wise. It begins to drift, to play, to turn over in gentle, careless rolls, like those lazy waves on the beach. One never knows what chance treasures these easy, unconscious rollers may toss up. On the smooth white sand of the conscious mind, what perfectly rounded stone, what rare shell from the ocean floor. But it must not be sought for, or heaven forbid, dug for. No, no dredging of the sea bottom here. That would defeat one's purpose. The sea does not reward those who are too anxious, too greedy, or too impatient. To dig for treasures shows not only impatience and greed, but lack of faith. Patience, patience, patience is what the sea teaches us. Patience and faith. One should lie empty, open, choiceless as a beach, waiting for a gift from the sea. Thank you. Maybe I ought to go to the beach more often and learn some patience. <laughs> okay, next I'd like to introduce our new superintendent. This is his first meeting, uh, Mr. Mark Stefanik. And since he doesn't have any items on the agenda today, I'll let him lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So would you all please rise. <laughs> allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, earlier we had a work session and we covered uh, three topics. One was the 2015-16 student enrollment. Uh, the next topic was the 2015-16 budget update because the state finally has a budget. And the last item was bus safety and stop arm procedures. And two of those items, the student enrollment and budget update, you will hear a little bit about in the uh, body of the meeting today. Okay, next, approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Okay, have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Agenda approved. Next item, student board member reports. Uh, well, the experience will start with Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. This is weird doing a board meeting in here. It doesn't feel right. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about Jarvisburg Elementary, my favorite, J.P. Knapp, um, and Moyock Middle School for their events for the month of October. 
Um, Driversburg Elementary has been working hard this month. Recently, the news crew interviewed Mr. Stefanik, did I say it right? Okay. Um, our new superintendent and posed some very interesting questions. This will be aired on their morning news. Did you know that? Okay, that's fun to say. Um, coming up for the month of October is their fall book fair, which begins October 7th and runs through October 15th. They'll also be having an Egyptian animal assembly sponsored by JAGS and the local fire department will be coming out on October 5th for fire safety. For JP Knapp, um, they will be recognized on Tuesday, October 6th in Raleigh by State Superintendent June Atkinson for achieving a 100% cohort graduation rate. Spartan Spirit Week will begin October 5th through 8th. The first quarter will end on October 8th for the early college. All JPNAP sophomores will be job shadowing on Friday, October 9th. There will be no COA classes on Monday and Tuesday, October 12th and 13th, which I am very excited about. Okay. Um, there will be a senior meeting at JPNAP on Tuesday, October 13th. All juniors will take the PSAT on Wednesday, October 14th. And there will be a sad bonfire of the Students Against Destructive Decisions Club um, on Friday, October 16th, with Red Ribbon Week beginning the following week on Tuesday, October 20th. Um, and from Moyak Middle School, they will begin to celebrate Rib Ribbon Week as well on October 26th through 30th. They will have their first chorus concert of the year on October the 9th, and they will have the football games on the 7th and 21st. Soccer and volleyball play at home on the 13th and 29th, and they say to come and support their student athletes, and they don't have this in there, but probably to support their chorus too, because I know that their shows are always very well. So I'll pass it on to you. Okay, and Sydney Christian is our new junior board member from Curry Tuck High School, and she has a report of both, I guess, Mary Kate and her. <laughs> yes. I will be talking about Curry Tuck Middle, Curry Tuck High, Griggs Elementary, and Not Silent Elementary. For Curry Tuck County Middle School, we will be taking all of the eighth grade girls to a celebration for women in mathematics at Elizabeth City State University on October 8th. They will be participating in math competitions, cheer competitions, and essay contests, along with attending workshops sponsored by NASA. The 8th grade recognition for fall athletes will be on October 28th at halftime of the football game. The fall sports pictures will be October 9th. The band will be having their fruit sale beginning October 7th. The cheerleaders will be having a kiddie camp for K-5 through students on Saturday, October 24th. The campers will cheer with the middle school cheerleaders at the game on October 28th. For Currituck County High School, we have a big shout out to the Currituck High FFA for hosting the Northeast, Northeast Regional Leadership Conference on September 17th. Over 300 FFA students represented the 19 districts at the conference. Everyone was so complimentary of our advisors, Missy Swain and Daniels Meads, as well as our facilities. Congratulations to the Athletic Director Robert Woodley on receiving the Charlie Adams Distinguished Service Award for Region 1 at the Regional Athletic Directors Conference at East Carolina University. Congratulations to newest inductees to the Currituck High Beta Club. We're very proud to recognize the 35 new inductees. We are also currently registering juniors and sophomores for the PSAT. The deadline is next week. The guidance department will be sponsoring a senior parent night on October 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. In addition, there will be a College Day event on October 19th at 8.30 a.m. for upperclassmen where representatives from community colleges and four-year universities will be available to discuss options for post-secondary education with students. Lastly, Homecoming will be held on October 23rd versus Bertie County. Spirit Week events will take place October 29th to 23rd or 19th to 23rd, excuse me, and will include a powder puff game on October 20th. We hope you will join us. And for Griggs, we, they will be participating in a fire prevention assembly on Monday, October 5th. Our book fair will be held October 13th to 16th with a family reading night on Thursday, October 15th from 5 to 7. Red Ribbon Week will be celebrated among students and staff for the week of October 19th to 23rd. Their PBIS recommend, recognition day for the first nine weeks is planned for October 30th, along with the kickoff to our first Obos of the year. Grig students and YAF staff will be reading the tale of Despero. And lastly, for Not Silent Elementary, their book fair is scheduled for October 19th through 23rd with a book and movie night for from on October 21st from 5 to 7 p.m. 
the fall festival will be held on October 30th from 5 to 7 in the gym. Great. And Thank you, Sydney. Next will be our new junior representative from J.P. Napperley College, Jacob Walton. All right, so I'll be discussing Shawboroughs Central and Moyock Elementary Schools. So for Shawboroughs Elementary, the Mustangs have been a busy herd this month. All parents and students are invited to the Educational Resource Fair on October 6th. Firefighters will be visiting on October 9th as part of Fire Prevention Week. The annual Penny Warden Support Kids Walk for Cancer will take place in early October, and the Shelbury Elementary School's PTA will host the <coughs> Fall Festival on October 16th. There's also several events planned during Red Ribbon Week on October 26th to October 30th. For Central Elementary School, um, the Eagle Leaders have had a very busy month. Students are still very excited about earning Eagle Leader tickets, and teachers are continuing to review and reteach PBIS matrices and their expectations. The Fall Scholastic Book Fair was well received and closed last week. Moving forward, there are a lot of notable events to announce. First, the makeup date for Fall Pictures is October 6th. Our first Leader of Character Assembly is October 22nd at 9.30, and our fall parties and celebratory events will be held in the morning on October 30th, 2015. More information about the latter will be sent home closer to the date. Teachers have been very busy with their benchmark assessments and are starting to look at data to make decisions for meeting the needs of all their students. Please check out our school website to find out about these and many other events posted in the calendar section. And lastly, for Moyak Elementary, uh, it's been quite an action-packed month for the Panthers. During this month, the firefighters will be joining them in the gym classes as part of the Fire Prevention Week. They'll also be participating in a penny war October 13th to October 16th in support of the Kids Walk for Kids Who Have Cancer. There's also a lot of great events planned during Red Ribbon Week to encourage the young Panthers to make healthy choices. We have our costume family reading night on October 15th where they'll dress like our favorite book characters and read aloud some books that include those characters. On October 29th, the kindergartners will be participating in the second annual Letterland Day, where they will dress in costumes, participate in some literacy stations, and have a parade to celebrate how much they are learning about letters and sounds. Finally, the PTA will host the Fall Festival on October 23rd. Great. Thank you, Jacob. And Katie and Sydney. <laughs> Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is the 2015-16 student enrollment update. Uh, Ms. Kinzel, the assistant superintendent. Is this already on? Okay. Okay, very good. Oh, good afternoon, members of the board. Um, each month we've been um, providing you with updates about our enrollment and how it's been progressing since, well, June. And uh, this evening we'd like to provide a more formal uh, presentation for you based on our enrollment numbers on the first month report and um, be able to share that information as well with the public. This first slide here um, is our first month's principal's monthly report. It's a PMR. Uh, the district and state collects monthly enrollment information by school and by grade level and it is submitted through a report through PowerSchool uh, that helps to generate and create the ADM or the average daily membership um, numbers for that are, are used to calculate funding. So this is our first month's report, again by school and by grade level, and of course taking a, a high level view of it, um, looking down at our overall enrollment as of the first month of school, it's 4,021. By itself it's not that stunning or marvelous information, but um, when we start using it to compare, how do we, how are our numbers compared to where we were last year? And so this next slide illustrates um, a comparison of this year's enrollment numbers to last year's same time, first month's report, and being able to do some figures in terms of how much change are we seeing at the individual school level. So this particular uh, chart does, does that kind of a comparison from the first month report this year to last year. And you'll see in the green slides, or the green shaded parts of this slide, um, areas where we're seeing some significant change, increases in enrollment by school. So 
Uh, looking at this slide, Central Elementary School has uh, a nice little bump there of over 6%. Uh, compared to last year's first month's report. The high school, Curtauk County High School, um, has an equally 6% or more uh, increase there. Um, the Curtauk Middle School, also 5% increase over last year's first month. And Jarvisburg Elementary School, a whopping 9.5% over last year. Um, having this kind of uh, information to help us try to project enrollment in the future, where are we anticipating growth? Um, and, and how are our schools set to handle the capacity that might be needed if continued growth goes at the same rate? So it's good to always look back and compare where we are from this point because we have seats for everybody right now, yay, <laughs> um, and being able to then kind of measure where we need to go in the future. Um, I pointed out some of the areas of growth on this chart, but also you can see that there are also uh, details that show where we have some uh, decline in, in the enrollment. And again, this kind of looks, it comes out very clearly whenever I, I pull up the next slide and we're going to compare multiple years. When looking over the last five years by school and comparing again to where we are here, first month in 2015-16 school year compared to the first month in previous years, uh, we can see, you know, how are we comparing from this year to previous years? Uh, this is color coded to show green, meaning there's been growth and red to be able to show that there's been a decline. If there's no color in it, obviously there was no change, no growth, no decline. Um, what I take away from, from this particular uh, chart, especially with the color coding, is that there are some um, patterns of growth that move, move across all five years in several of our schools, as well as some pretty steady decline in, in our enrollment in some schools over the period of five years. So, um, for example, you can take a look at Jar Jarvisburg Elementary School has seen increased growth over the period of the last five years. Uh, again, leading up to that 9.5% growth at Jarvisburg Elementary School. Um, at Sharborough Elementary School, you can see we've, we've seen a con continued growth, um, pretty significant over time, um, where we've got a, a trajectory where we can actually predict that, hey, we're going to continue to see some growth there. Uh, when we look at the high school's numbers, you can see that the pattern of growth is, is consistent there, but um, it's not necessarily incremental or continuing to show that gradual growth. It's, it's rather, you know, I don't know, it's just, it's all over the place. One year it's a significant growth, and then it's just a, a small um, growth measure. So that, that's going to be something we'll have to watch as far as how it goes over the next um, reporting period and over the next several years. Uh, I think it's significant to note uh, to not only to the board but to the public that what we're seeing based on this um, type of a pattern is that we're seeing some significant growth in the southern part of our county. And Jarvisburg uh, feeds into Curtick County Middle School, Central feeds into Curtick County Middle School, and those are two schools that have had some pretty significant growth lately. And so we're seeing growth continue at the middle school that we can project that will end up at the high school. So that's important for us to know. Okay. Again, looking at the district totals overall, you'll see that across the board for the last five years we have on our first month's report, we've seen some pretty significant mm -hmm. growth. So. Uh, it ranges from, you know, a low 2%, barely 2%, to where we are right now at, or I'm sorry, two years ago when we were at almost 5% growth at the first month reporting. And today, um, this year's report, we're looking at, oh, that was last year's, uh, we're, we have a difference of about 3.5% compared to last year. Okay. Sandy, can you explain, mm -hmm. like you did in the... Can I go back? Sorry. No, that's quite all right. Just for about Knott Island, the reason we saw oh, a yes. significant decrease, just so people Absolutely. don't and, think we're and, demanding and, Knott no. Island. <laughs> I appreciate you, you pointing that out. I appreciate you You're pointing that out. you in the rain right now, we met. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're floating away. Um, yes, and, I, and I'm sorry for not pointing that out. I was fixated on the growth. Um, yes, you'll notice that Knott Island has a pretty significant pattern of 
decline over time. And there are some uh, influences that we've inflicted <laughs> to create some of that. Um, several years ago, we moved a large population of our sixth graders that year. In fact, uh, we, we took sixth grade and the rising sixth graders. So we took two uh, classes of students. We moved them to the middle school. And so that obviously created a large um, decrease. Almost 35% of the school's population went that year. And that's the result of that. Um, also, because it's a small school and um, the population varies so much, I mean, percentages are percentages. So when you're, you know, one student can make a pretty big impact on a percentage. And um, with smaller uh, class sizes, again, once a, a larger group moves out, uh, you know, 20, 20 kids goes out and only 14 come in, um, it's going to show a negative, a pretty significant negative on that. So, again, that, um, the significant decline was really because we moved a lot, large body of students out. Thank you. That's You're welcome. Sure when no. saw it I'm, I appreciate <laughs> you reminding me to bring that out. Um, well, on that same note, and, and I'm glad because anomalies happen and sometimes we're the culprits, you'll see um, J.P. Knapp Early College on this slide has a pretty significant increase. Well, that's because as they were, um, as, as they were opened, they, they opened with the freshman class only. Right. And then the next year we added another freshman class, and so now we had two, two class of kids in, in the school. And so as they grew out, Obviously, their overall population grew, so that's going to be reflected in their numbers as well. So thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Okay, so what is, why is this significant? Why is it important to us to watch for this? Because, again, as I said earlier, the uh, principal's monthly reports are pulled together and generate our ADM. That ADM is what is used to help us determine funding from the state. That's the number that, that, that we receive funding on. So when we look at our, our DPI ADM allotment from last year, and we compare it to where we are at the first month of this year's PMR report, um, there are policies in place through the allotment policy manuals that allow for adjustments in our funding based on growth compared to the ADM allotment. So when we look at that, uh, the regulations are we have to have at least a 2% increase or 100 students in order to be eligible to request additional funding from DPI. So what this chart shows is um, where we are in relation to how we were funded. And again, you can see here that we're just barely under the 2% requirement when we pull out our 13th our super seniors from J.P. Knapp. And I'm painting a worst case scenario for us right now. Uh, we're, we are seeking clarification on how they fall if they're considered seniors, even though it's their um, super senior, additional senior year. And um, if, if those numbers fall back into play, then we will meet the 2% and we will be able to request additional funding, which we plan to do. And that funding... 2% is approximately $400,000? That's what our finance officer tells me, that it could very well be at that much. So we might either gain 400000 or get nothing, nothing for the additional students? And, and it's important to know that we've worked hard within the budget that the, the board has established. And within <clears throat> last year's budget and the continuing resolution, um, we have already had to add additional positions to be able to absorb some of this, this growth that you're seeing. So the $400,000 extra would help us to recoup some of the money that we're already fronting for positions. Um, and then, of course, with other additional expenses to, to be able to open up new classrooms that we've had to do. But I'd like to be able to say that we'd be able to use this uh, additional funding to further reduce class sizes. Okay. Um, just finally, um, you know, what's next beyond the first month's report? We're going to continue monitoring. Um, again, the second month, uh, the second month's report is very significant in terms of it being a part of that formula for determining our average daily membership. Um, as of today, our enrollment count is um, 4012, and that includes the, the 13 JP Knapp super seniors. And that number does, like I said, put us within the 2% overage, and we could apply for that. Um, if Worst case scenario, we pull them out 
then we fall again just below and we'd be at like 1.7 percent and again we'll, we'll watch our monitor uh, watch and monitor those numbers carefully at the second month's report um, we are held to individual class size standards that are set by uh, the state and um, we will be monitoring that closely as well because we do have a couple of class sizes while we meet the LEA average um, that we are over the state individual max and uh, plans are underway if they maintain through the second month that we will be probably reorganizing the classrooms um, as best we can if we're able to and so that's also a consideration okay thank you and I guess the last comment would be we may still lose a few students yes. because the state just finalized their budget and we have a few that may take advantage of the opportunity that's scholarships that's so correct. that will come into play yes. right. thank you Ms. Kinzel right. thank you very much okay uh, next item 2015-16 <clears throat> budget highlights Lori Trussell finance officer Uh, board, Mr. Stefanik. Uh, a few of the highlights this year. Teachers and instructional support received experience steps, and those that moved to steps 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25 received salary increases. Other teachers that were 0 to 4 years on, on the experience scale received an increase too. They received that increase in August. Other raises will be done in October. Assistant principals and principals received their steps or a $809 bonus if they do not receive a step increase. All school system employees, even those receiving raises and step increases, employed on November 1st will receive a $750 bonus to be paid in December. And that amount is not subject to retirement and it's prorated for permanent part-time employees. Driver's Ed funding is fully funded for 15-16 and 16-17 fiscal years. The teacher assistant funding remained except for the non-recurring funds, which was about 5 or 6 percent. No COLA raises for okay, retirees. Before you go on, Lori, that's the equivalent of about one teacher assistant, correct? Correct. Okay. It's about one teacher assistant. Um, rehired retirees are eligible to retain health insurance. Fully um, fund student growth, the budget did in, in fiscal year 15, 16, and 16, 17. Textbook funded was increased about 40%, and it now includes digital resources. The budget expanded Read to Achieve camps to first and second graders instead of just third graders. Hospitalization and retirement had small increases and transportation was down 5% due to fuel cost decreases. Any questions? Okay, are there any other questions? Because we did receive a report, a more detailed report earlier on this. So. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Ms. Trussell. Okay, next item, Trillium Services. Doug Toll, Director of Exceptional Children's Services. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Stefanik, board members, um, it's my pleasure to talk to you all about, uh, I think, an initiative that we um, started talking about, I guess it was about six months ago, um, I had the opportunity to talk with um, Dr. Sam Shepard, who was the Exceptional Children's Director in Winston-Salem, Forsyth County Schools, and when we were having this conversation, we were experiencing, I think, a lot of um, kind of behavioral challenges within our schools, um, some difficulties, so we were looking at some ways to um, address some of those concerns. Um, I brought some of the ideas back and we essentially formed a, a collaborative group um, and, and started that process. Um, I do have two folks up here with me. Um, this is Dana Parker. She's our behavior liaison. And wave Dana so they know who, there you go. Um, she's supported through PRC 29 grant, which is um, it's the old Willie M definition. Um, and Willie M went away, um, but it's PRC 29 now, so it's a grant funded. Um, Athena Chastine could not be here, so Ms. Arrington's here in case um, you don't have any questions. Um, Dana represents the behavior component, and Virginia would represent the mental health component. Um, is that all right? No, okay. All right. Um, we got together and we talked and um, wanted to make this obviously a, a community group, a collaborative group. So we 
uh, initiated conversations with Trillium Health, which was formerly ECBH, um, and they've merged into Trillium Health, the Currituck County DSS, and the public schools. Um, and essentially it said, here's what we recognize as a school system, that schools are where we have the majority of, you know, of our needs in the, in the community with um, all of our students being based at specific areas. So that's where uh, mental health needs are often discovered through our um, currently RTI MTSS process and where the most supports are usually needed. Um, we also know that students who experience these mental health problems often struggle in many facets of school. Um, academically, socially, behaviorally, will experience problems in the school, experience problems in the community. Uh, schools are recognized as places where students can receive mental health services. So there's a lot of models already in schools currently where mental health services are provided in the schools. Um, Wake County, Asheville County, some of the smaller counties as well. Um, students who have needs, who have more needs on the mental health continuum are at higher risk for dropping out. Um, in fact, there was a study that stated that students with emotional disturbances dropped out at a rate of 50% compared to an overall national rate of 10%. Um, students who need more support on the mental health continuum are referred out of schools here in Currituck County, and they travel to Virginia, Pasquotank, um, Elizabeth City, or D Dare County. Um, Currituck County has very little resources when it comes to meeting the mental health needs of our students. We also recognize that the ratio of counselors, social workers, school psychologists are below the recommended levels. The folks we have work very hard and very diligently to meet the needs of our students, um, but through no fault of the school system, the funding levels are not what they should be to meet the recommended levels of staffing. Also that um, the mental health needs of our students is an area needed of improvement. Um, we support our students, families, community, and the schools themselves. And I guarantee you can ask any of the administrators in the rooms if that would be an added bonus to them, and they would all say yes. So we presented this information to them. This is some of the information that we shared with them. So I know we just said our numbers were at 41 or 4,100. Um, when we did this survey, we had 3,900 students in the schools at the time. Oh, excuse me. I'm a little ahead of myself. Um, we have 3,900 students when we did this. We have two full-time school psychologists. The um, APA actually recommends one school psychologist for every 1,000 students, um, three school social workers, 10 counselors, a behavior liaison, and then Ms. Parker works with the behavior coach as well. Okay, before you go to the next one, you said we have two school psychologists. Yes, sir. Okay. Is most of their time still taken up testing and identifying students with different... Uh, Issues um, and rather question. than counseling? Right. So their new um, evaluation is actually geared more towards student learning. It reflects what um, standards teachers are being evaluated on. Um, they do have the responsibility of administering cognitive tests, behavioral assessments. Um, so they still do all that. The standard, though, now is for them to also serve on RTI teams, MTSS teams, work with student learning, um, behavioral support, if there's crisis as well. So they're really stretched thin in what they're doing. So in the spring of 2015, um, our group comprised of myself, um, Ms. Arrington, Ms. Parker, Ms. Chastine, they went and school to school and asked all the counselors, what students do you think um, would have types of needs that we currently don't have supports for? And they identified 13% of our student population um, as having, being candidates for mental health or behavioral services that we couldn't currently meet at our existing level. Now, our, our counselors currently work with students. Um, their behavior, mental health, they work with students as well. But this is outside of that. So we think of things in tiers, and we're talking about the very top tier of our students. So that's about 500 students um, that we need access to. We pulled some information down here. Um, so last school year, we had 699 behavioral referrals. 840 days out of school and 740 days of in-school suspension. And so I just did some rough math. That was about um, four and a half, if you looked at one student, 840 days was about four and a half years of the school that a student would miss if that was one student. So you can see that mental health and behavioral support is essential in helping our schools meet the needs of some of our um, most challenging students. This is what is currently available in Currituck County. We utilize mobile crisis. Um, they're part of integrated family services. 
Um, last year, Integrated Family Services worked with 20 fa 27 families. Uh, there's a Kids First, which provides services one day a week. There's two private providers in Currituck County. One doesn't accept Medicaid, and the other one is only one day a week. So here's what, you know, after we present our information, this was our goal. Um, we wanted to increase, obviously, mental health and behavioral <laughs> support, um, the direct services for all students, staff, and community members. And we had a very um, lofty goal, um, and we're going to stick to that, and this is ultimately what we want. Um, we also would like to have seamless mental health services in the schools, recognizing that if parents don't have to check students out of school, um, they're going to stay in school and not miss as much school. And then build the capacity of all employees to address mental health needs, because we know that the students who are in the schools, our teachers, and our support staff are the ones that run into the mental health issues first. And if we can build their capacity, then that helps with um, increasing student achievement, decreasing some of the issues that we're having. This is the continuum of services that we talk about. We work very hard in working with Ms. Parker and Ms. Chastain in trying to coordinate um, the differences between what a behavior and what a mental health um, concern is. We'll not go through all of this, but it just talks about levels of support. Um, we're talking about counseling that gets up here when we've gone through this continuum of services and trying to provide support to students. So, again, just going through the process. Um, after we presented our information, Trillium agreed that there was sufficient need to establish a relationship with a recognized mental health provider. Integrated Family Services was the recommended provider. It worked out perfectly because we already had a relationship with them. Um, and here's the agreement that we um, talked about with them. They're going to provide school-based therapy to um, Kurtuck County High School, the two middle schools, Kurtuck Middle, Moyuk Middle, Moyuk Elementary, and Charborough Elementary to start off with. Those schools were chosen because they had the highest referral rate <coughs> and largest population of students that received services from mobile crisis or integrated family services. So. They can serve children who are recipients of, recipients of Medicaid, who have behavioral and emotional problems that hinder the learning environment, um, mental health and or substance abuse diagnosis, mm -hmm. and the parents have to consent to these services as well. This is a no-cost service because they will be billing <coughs> Medicaid, and if the students have no insurance, they'll be billing a third party for that. So this is a no-cost um, service to us. Um, the one agreement that we, the Integrated Family Services, asked is that they had office space, access to our um, Wi-Fi, and then a meeting space for them and the students. This is a big part right here, within one year. Um, it's a licensing issue right now. Um, the lady that we have, Janice Culpepper, currently um, is lacking a certification to build um, third party. So within a year, they anticipate having that ability to, to build third party such as Why oh, that was one addition blue. Okay. Um, tri -care, care. right care so with the addition of this certification <clears throat> after a year she would be able to build those third parties which would be big in addition to that she would also be able to perhaps see students outside um, we had initially talked about possibly setting up space outside and having an office after hours as well um, the school-based model, um, again, this, this is more about the process that we take. We've designated school administrators and counselors as essentially the gatekeepers to the referral system. So they would make the referrals to Integrated Family Services. Integrated Family Services would do the assessment. Um, typically, they'll do the assessment at home. If they need to, they'll do it at school. They will then contact the counselor to determine the level of service. Um, and then they'll contact the parents to get consent for services. Their base services would be once every two weeks, um, and then if needs extenuate, they would either increase or decrease that. We will get two reports. One will come to the central office telling us how many referrals that we have and how many students are receiving services. The building level principal will get um, an individualized report as well. And again, here's the schools that are receiving services. This process started um, this past week with Ms. Culpepper going into the schools, meeting school staff, 
um, working out the logistics, looking at office space, things of that nature. Um, we sent out a PowerPoint to the principals, asking them to you know, let their staff know what's going to be happening. Um, they've already, Integrated Family Services has already met with um, the, the schools that are involved, their counselors and administrators, and ha have already presented this information to us. She, I believe, already has one referral. Our school has already done one referral, but anticipates starting services, trying to start services and assessments next week. And that's essentially where we're at at this point. If I flew through that, I'm sorry. Um, Questions? You were talking about them getting the um, ability to bill third-party insurance companies. Mm -hmm. That is something on their part that they're doing. That's not anything that's holding up. That's, that's correct. That's, that's a license um, requirement um, for her to be able to bill you know, different parties besides Medicaid, correct? Okay. I think currently she's at LCSW. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I know students with emotional, psychological problems very often are disruptive in the regular classroom. How do you balance them receiving service with the kids in the classroom who have a right to an education without disruption? Well, that's really what we're trying to do because that is what my job is as behavior support. Administrators will contact me and um, administrators will contact me when there's a student who's very disruptive. So what I typically do is maybe just do a quick observation of the classroom, making sure it's not classroom management or something with a, a teacher issue. And then we look at what is just behavior. If we change certain things, then behavior should change. You know, if we make sure that teachers have quality instruction, if we make sure that we're giving clear choice to a kid and clear consequence, then we should have a change in behavior if we're doing all those things. And what has happened, like when I started in December, what we were finding is with some students that wasn't enough. And that's when we knew we needed help. Because we only have one mental health therapist. And when we're talking about 400 kids that people identified as needing services above and beyond, then obviously one person couldn't provide that. So we know these children have needs. And we need to get them help so they don't disrupt their regular room. And that's really where it all began. The teachers and administrators calling out to say we need help. We have children that we know that have issues that they need to you know, be able to deal with, that we can work with so they can be successful in the classroom. Okay. Is this an outside company coming in to do this? It Are is. Are we legally bound in any way in any decision they make that we don't want them to? Well, we signed a memorandum of agreement with them, but essentially we have to get parent consent to um, allow them to work with the student. Um, and then they're allowing um, integrated family services mm -hmm. to provide those counseling services, which would be recommended outside of the school, um, inside the school. Mr. Simmons, I will say that um, as part of this process, we've, we've sent consent information, their memorandum of agreement, and a request for guidance on whether we need additional uh, consent forms or anything that would cover us through any kind of liability by offering this service through the school. So um, other districts have done this. Some have opted to have an additional consent form with current schools on it or whatever their district to cover them in addition to what Trillium would put out there. So um, it's we're still getting that information back. And before they see the first student, we will have some, something for them. So to you're saying that we've <coughs> contacted our yes. lawyer and he's seen all of the... Yes. <coughs> Basically, these are students who we would have encouraged their parents to see a counselor anyway. And what we're doing <coughs> is just allowing this to take place in school so that we know it's getting We're done. bringing the counselor We're to bringing them. the counselor to them because for so many of our families, it's very difficult to go back to Virginia to find someone. I mean, you saw what Mr. Troll said. There's no one in for a tough building. Someone's one day a week. There's no one for Medicaid. And then we have a large population of students who are uninsured completely uninsured and we have nowhere to send them. My, my question was liability right. wise, yes. our right. attorneys have approved, I mean, the counselors, since they're not employed by Curtis County right. School, mm -hmm. this is an outside firm coming in to cancel our kids. And they have background checks and they, yeah, that's all they've done. Sure. But again, we, we're <coughs> looking to see if there needs to be another layer of protection for the school district <coughs> through a consent form. So we're waiting on Neil. That's to correct. Mm -hmm. I, I have background with contracts like this, and I would 
what they do is they provide the services they can provide in school, and then if they, there's a recommendation for more services outside of school, then that's just an agreement between the family and the But we're not bound as a school system. If they call for extra you know, uh, counseling or something, we're not bound as a school system to get No, no. They would have to agree to that, and that would be in the family if there was a cost for that. And part of the continuous services like they are giving therapy to a student once a month or so. And I'll say this, remember, this is um, Trillium um, Health Resources, which is part of Mobile Crisis, whom we already um, allow into the schools as well. So, you know, Mobile Crisis already comes into our schools and works with our students. But it is a, a different, um, I guess. More proactive. Uh, correct. Thank you. Where are they Right. And then Integrated Family Services has an office in the city. Yes. And just for some comparison, Dare County, um, I believe, currently, in the last time I talked to them, had four um, counselors through this type of model and also um, provided behavioral support in their classrooms. And that is our goal, is to, to build capacity. Um, but first, they need to see the referrals from the students <coughs> that come in. Um, and so our goals right now are to try to reach as many students as possible. And Ms. Parker mentioned a number, I think, that I saw in a report that you uh, gave me at one time that we have, what is it, 420 students that have some type of an identified exceptionality? Uh, it's gone up to, you know, I was just talking to Ms. Russell about this, about 454 students right now. 454. Mm -hmm. We're about 12.1%. Yeah, is that a large amount for a district our size, which, the or is that average? The federal or? government caps you at 12.5%, and they say if you're over 12.5%, you're over-identifying. So when I got here, we were probably about 8 or 9%. We've risen to about 12, right about 12%. Um, with that, we did see an increase in funding to, uh, I think Ms. Russell was telling me, um, about $242,000 for state um, funding with mm -hmm. the increase in identification. Um, but we've changed some of our processes as well to try to meet the needs of our students. Is that 420? Oh, go and ahead. It's not all about identification. We have right. gotten a lot of transfers. And this is correct. If your um, your rate of students in the exceptional children program is greater than twelve point five percent, okay. How is that right? It's done by an IEP team. They have to make a decision whether or not there's a, a need for um, services to <coughs> exceptional children. And that what I'm saying is, if, if you're at that twelve point five threshold, and you say okay, we've over identified. If it's a test that's the same across the board. What do you change to make that? So we've looked at the processes that we've implemented, um, and a lot of times the um, discretion comes down to an IAP team, which is referred either through a parent referral or through the RTI team. And so the IAP team um, has to look at 14 disabling conditions, and it's a three-pronged test. And so the first is they have to meet it, have a disability, they have to require specially designed instruction, and um, I just blanked on the third one. Um, it, well, so, um, but they, the IP team has to answer the three questions. And so, you know, there's a lot of different areas. Um, our highest area is learning disabilities. Half of our students have a learning disability. Um, and so we use a Half of the identified students. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. So <laughs> half of the identified <laughs> students. That's correct. <laughs> And I asked, I wanted to bring this back up because it kind of begs to, how do you, how do you yeah. correct over-identify? Yeah. Well, and, and this is what he, he's mentioned several times, RTI and MTSS. And I know those are just <coughs> random letters to most of you, but um, that truly, all of those letters are, are it's a problem-solving process. And it follows a tiered approach where we, we strengthen what we do for all students, mm -hmm. and then we, we target uh, specific needs, and most of the time that'll correct some of the, the the deficits that students are experiencing or that may exhibit academically or behaviorally. And for those that it does, then we have intensive supports that would include uh, exceptional children's services or mental health services or behavioral liaison support for PRC 29. I think it's a great program. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Need, need
Yeah, this 420 doesn't count AIG students, right? No, it no. does not. Okay. No. Great. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Doug. Ms. Parker, Ms. Arrington. Okay, next item, uh, consent agenda. Do I have a motion for approval? Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, nobody signed up for the public comment session, so we'll skip down to information items. Our next work session will be November 5th, 2015, 4 o'clock, right here at the Professional Learning Center on the J.P. Knapp Early College Campus. Next Board of Education meeting will be November 5th at 6.30 over at the Historic Courthouse. And now for board member comments, we'll start with Ms. Etheridge. Um, again, I'd like to welcome Mark Stefanik. We're happy to have you. And um, looking forward to working with you. Sydney and Jacob, it's a pleasure to be working with y'all as well. Um, I had the opportunity to go to one of the football games. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, what a great turnout to support the Knights. And I was really um, happy to see our student cheering section. Uh, I thought it was great to see such uh, team spirit and I uh, really enjoyed that. So I urge everyone to, to go out to a good game and support the Knights. Thank you. Great. Mr. Simmons? Uh, same thing, Mark. Glad to see you back. <clears throat> uh, look forward to working with you. Uh, same thing, I've had a chance to go to a couple football games and like I said, big crowds to come see our kids. And that's about it. Okay, Ms. Kraft? Um, I also want to echo the sentiments of the rest of them to you, Mark, and Sydney and Jacob. A welcome. I had the opportunity this month to visit all of our schools. I've been very impressed with what's going on. And also went to the community Rachel's Challenge event at Marriott Middle School and the Rachel's Challenge Assembly at JPNAV. And that's a wonderful program. I'm really excited about it. I'm hoping that we're going to see positive side of that. Thank you. Ms. Gattis? I um, want to welcome everybody too um, and join our team. Um, on top of that, I attended our um, Curry County Educational Ministries meeting again this month. We have had some new churches join, so that's exciting. Um, and this month, we actually also invited or had um, communications with our Fellowship of Christian Athletes group, came out and met with our church leaders who are on the team working to kind of partner those churches with our schools. Um, it's a group that is growing, it's making changes, we're making big steps, I'm excited for it, um, and it's going well. We're still looking for other churches, and we welcome any and everybody in the county that wants to get involved. Um, the next meeting is the same day as the school board meeting, November 5th, but at 9 a.m., um, and it's at the Extension Center, Cooperative <coughs> Extension Center. Um, so anybody that wants to come, please come out and join us. Um, other than that, the only other thing I want to throw out there, and it <coughs> ties into the schools in my opinion because it's um, part of our public safety, Knott's Island Volunteer Fire Department is in desperate need of volunteer firefighters. So if anybody in the community wants to join the volunteer firefighting team over in Knott's Island, come on over and join us because they need all the help they can get. And um, that's about it. Thank you. Stay safe tomorrow. Yeah. I'd like to uh, echo the sentiments of my fellow board members plus I'd like to mention that we're here at the Professional Learning Center having our school board meeting because emergency management was monitoring or still is monitoring the uh, path of the hurricane over at the uh, courthouse. So, you know, that's why we're here. And with that, do I have a motion for adjournment? Wait, 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 wait. Mark wants to talk. <laughs> okay. Um, just informing the board that uh, in October, and this will be the second day in October, uh, it has been designated as National Principals Month. Um, and the principals associations have uh, set aside uh, the month to recognize the significant role that principals and assistant principals uh, play in the educational process. And so uh, I'd like to thank the principals uh, in the Curry County School District and the assistant principals for a day on a daily basis. And uh, look forward to working with all of them. And we can give them a round of applause to show our appreciation. Thank you. Okay, did somebody already make a motion? I think I did. Oh, you think? <laughs> I did. I moved. Okay, so I have a motion and a second. All in favor of adjourning the meeting, say aye. Aye. Okay, meeting adjourned. See you all November 5th. <laughs>